across the fence, we're marking the anniversary of the St. Albans Raid. In the pursuit of rebel robbers, we'll learn about a local legend and a minister who helped bring the Confederates to justice. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The St. Albans Raid in October of 1864 was the northernmost land action in the American Civil War. The Confederate soldiers who swooped in from Canada stole more than $200,000 from three banks in St. Albans. That's the equivalent of close to $3 million today. We pick up the story from associate producer Keith Silva and Civil War historian Howard Coffin, who are just north of St. Albans on the road to Sheldon, Vermont. The St. Albans raid happened quickly. It was over in 20 minutes to a half hour. The raiders had to get out of town fast. They were getting shot at. They head north on the road to Sheldon and they quickly realize they've got a problem with some of the horses. They didn't have time to be selective when they sold them. They're coming along this road and lo and behold, coming toward them down this road is a lone horseman. And as he gets closer, they can see he is mounted on a fine steed. They stop him. They take the horse. One of the raiders jumps on and they leave him with one of their nags. The man is bewildered. What's happened here? He knows nothing of the raid. He starts south toward St. Albans again. And it isn't long before he sees a bunch of horsemen coming his way again. It's the posse under Conger. As the posse approaches, they see one of the stolen horses the man is riding. They don't recognize the man, and they begin to shoot at him. The man jumps off the horse and starts across the field and all the way to the alder swamp on the edge of the woods over there, under fire. They don't hit him. He survives. When the raiders reached Sheldon, knowing the cavalry was in hot pursuit, they came to Black Creek and a covered bridge located on the site of that modern bridge. In the middle of the bridge was a farmer with a big load of hay. The raiders saw a chance to get rid of the cavalry once and for all by setting the hay and the bridge on fire. So they got out their Greek fire. Now they had intended to burn St. Albans. This was war. St. Albans was spared because of a rainy day and the fact that the grenades didn't work very well. But Greek fire worked on this bridge and they started a fire and then they rode away north. But the minister of this church on the hill overlooking the bridge saw what was happening, ran down the hill, put out the fire, saved the bridge, and the posse came along and crossed with ease. The Confederates wanted all the Yankee money they could get their hands on, and Bennett Young, through his scouting, knew that there was another bank that might be robbed in Sheldon. About a quarter mile north of the now smoking bridge was the Sheldon Bank. And the Confederates galloped up and went to the door, and it was locked. They'd gotten there too late. The bank was closed. But they looked across the street and saw this beautiful house owned by the Keith family. They didn't know it, but upstairs, recovering from a severe wound suffered the previous spring in the wilderness, was Captain Alfred Keith, and out front was his prized horse. The Confederates stole that beautiful horse and galloped on north. Captain Keith had an uncle named Rule. Rule Keith had gone south many years before and become an Episcopal minister in Virginia, becoming one of the best known in the whole state. On a summer day, in the rain, he had ridden to Arlington, Virginia to perform the marriage of the year in Virginia, Mary Custis and Robert E. Lee. What the Raiders didn't know was that they had just stolen the horse of the nephew of the man who had performed the marriage ceremony for the greatest Confederate of all, Robert 
E. Lee. The Confederates reached this hilltop in the darkness and looked down on the village of Enosburg. The lights were on. It was a stressful moment for the Confederates. Did the people in Enosburg know about the raid? Were they waiting armed in the streets? But they had to go down and cross the river, and they did for safety, and Canada was only a few miles away. That mountain is in Canada. The last physical barrier to the escape of the raiders was the Missisquoi River. And here at Enosburg, they had to cross it on a covered bridge that spanned the river right where this modern arch bridge is today. The Confederates here had to fear an ambush, but they rode quietly across the bridge and through Enosburg in the darkness and into the open fields beyond. There, Young gathered them and ordered them to split up into small groups and continue north across the border. Where history happens, always there are legends. And one of the more intriguing associated with the St. Albans raid concerns this house. Supposedly a farmer who had a modest house, the night of the raid saw some men on the hillside behind the farm burying something that might have been money. When they were gone, he went up there and dug up some of the stolen St. Albans loot. And he built this magnificent Victorian house here beside what is now busy Route 105, just east of Innisburg. The people here in the town of Franklin in 1910 erected this monument to the local men who served in the Civil War. We're close to the Canadian border here, and it's likely that some of the raiders passed through this town, probably along this road. They were very close to the Canadian border. They hoped by crossing over they would be safe. But Captain Conger's posse on reaching the border had a brief discussion and over they went onto the King's territory. Next morning, Bennett Young was having breakfast at a local farmhouse and in the door came Conger and arrested him. There was a fist fight. Conger said he was taking him back to St. Albans to hang him. They put him in a wagon, another fist fight and Young breaks away, but finally they nab him. And with Young and the rest of the raiders that they've captured, they start south for St. Albans, but they run into a group of British officials who take custody of the raiders and start them for Montreal, where they will be put in jail. Conger's posse captures 14 of the raiders. The rest escape. Back in St. Albans, a New Hampshire man named Morrison is dying from a Confederate bullet. Alnaeus Morrison, severely wounded in the abdomen, was brought here to his room in the America House. There was nothing they could do. He was put to bed, and soon he died. The only fatality of the St. Albans raid. It's a lowery day here in St. Albans. On again, off again, rain, dark sky, just the kind of weather that came on the day of the St. Albans raid. We're here along the east side of Taylor Park. All the buildings on the east side were witness to the raid. They're well preserved. The St. Albans Village School was built in 1860. And one of those who helped build it was Elnius Morrison, the only man killed in the St. Albans Raid. The day of the St. Albans Raid, the students were assembled in this room for an assembly. And then the raid broke out, word reached the school, and the students were hastened down the stairs 
to the basement for their own protection. But as they went down these stairs, they got a wonderful view out the windows of all the drama that was happening along Main Street. This room has a wonderful Civil War history. Recruiting meetings were held here, men signed up for the war, and speeches were given here against slavery. We've come full circle back in Taylor Park. The St. Albans raid has just happened. The town is in panic. The whole North Country is in panic. Will the Confederates strike again? Of course, they didn't. But troops are rushed to the northern border. General George Stannard, the hero of Gettysburg, is brought up to command them. And there are weeks and weeks of tension, but the Confederates never return. What happened to the Raiders? Well, Bennett Young's men, of course, were taken to Montreal, and there they were put on trial. It was a famous event. The issue was whether they should be extradited back to the United States to face trial here, and the result would almost certainly have been hangings. The trial went on, something of an international incident. The United States government got involved trying to bring the Raiders back here. But in the end, a Canadian judge saw it his own way and said, no, they don't have to come back across the border. They were soldiers doing their duty. So they went free. Eventually, $80,000 returned to St. Albans. Probably none of it reached Richmond. As the years passed, the St. Albans raid became a famous incident. Bennett Young became a major personality in the South and eventually headed the major Confederate veterans group. He was invited once to St. Albans for the 50th anniversary of the raid. He said yes, but the local veterans said no. He did not come. Once at a massive Confederate reunion in a big southern city, a parade was held and the star was to be the widow of Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. But the applause was loudest when Bennett Young, the hero of St. Albans, passed by. The St. Albans Raid was a Confederate victory, but it pales in importance to another victory that was won on that same October 19, 1864. 500 miles to the south in the Shenandoah Valley, Phil Sheridan's Union Army was fighting a Confederate army under Jubal Early. Early's troops early on were winning the day and then Sheridan led a great comeback in which the Vermont soldiers were tremendously important. Cedar Creek was a great Union victory, giving forever control of the Shenandoah Valley to the Union and making absolutely certain that Abraham Lincoln would be re-elected president. Our thanks to Howard for that look at the St. Albans Raid. Now, Howard mentioned the Battle of Cedar Creek, which took place on the same day as the raid. So tomorrow, we'll bring you the story of Cedar Creek. And if you missed the first part of our St. Albans Raid story, you can catch it anytime, along with all of our programs, by visiting the Across the Fence website. It is uvm.edu slash extension slash ATFence. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.